Fifteen dollars. I've been playing very good competition lately. How, how much of the competition and the defenses have to do with some of the offensive struggles lately? Do you think? Well, I think it has a lot to do with it. Uh, but you know, regardless of uh, who we're playing, we have to do uh, a better job, be more cognizant of trying to get the ball into the lane, uh, draw fouls, uh, to just. Uh, you know, not be so dependent uh, on the three-point shot. You know, I think we're a good shooting team. I think we've proven that, but uh, we've got to find other ways to score it again in this league uh, with, the, with the different types of defenses and uh, the pride they take in them uh, doesn't make our job easy. But again, if we can get stops, I think we're a really good uh, defense to offensive team. Uh, but in the half court, we got to be able to find ways to get that ball in the lane. When teams aren't letting you do that, though, I mean, what's the answer? If they're they're just such good defensive teams, got to execute better. Uh, you know, got to move the ball faster, uh, move ourselves faster, uh, get the ball reversed, and not and not settle uh, for being kept out of the paint. It's that simple. The Boston College game. The first, you know, Boston College game. What, um, what do you recall about that? You watched the tape of it, I'm sure. But um, you, you know, lead in that one. we had a big lead. Um, you know, we uh, failed to hold it uh, through uh, a few of our own errors. And uh, again, I thought I thought we were playing really well for about 30 minutes. And uh, you know, in the last. Five or eight minutes. I don't know if we felt like the game was over. Boston College never quit. Um, but uh, again, it's sort of been a, an Achilles heel of our team. And so we have to be able to put together a 40 minute game. How <clears throat> much of that is a function of depth? Um, well, in that game, we actually were using our depth <clears throat> in the lead, dissipated. Mm -hmm. So it is a function of depth, but not the way you're asking the question. <laughs> <laughs> At least that game was. Yeah. Did they do anything different from that first meeting, or has it been pretty much the same? No, it seems like they're playing a lot more uh, matchup zone. Uh, we saw that the first time around, but um, you know, against Clemson, against NC State, uh, I don't want to say they exclusively used it, but uh, a lot more than they'd shown in previous games, or at least when we had played them the first time. Um, so you know, I'd expect that they're going to be a team that's going to play you know more three-quarter court. Contain press back to their matchup zone. We've got to be able to find ways, like I said before, to get the ball in the paint uh, and be effective um, once we get there. What did you think of <clears throat> your 1-3-1 one, one zone? I thought it, um, it did what we wanted it to do in that um, you know we didn't want their primary scorers, Kyle Guy and um, Ty Jerome, to line up three-point shots. You know, they do such a great job of running them on off constant pin downs and flare screens that uh, you can't really do that against uh, a zone. You know, guys aren't cutting with you. And so our ability to recognize where those two on the floor were at all times was, was really high level. In the second half, like I said, they, you know, DeAndre Hunter was back on the floor. And now you have a third uh, terrific shooter. And so it changes the dynamic of our zone having to cover that many guys uh, on the perimeter. So, uh, you know, and they, they made a few adjustments at halftime, but I never felt as comfortable in the second half as we did in the first half in, in playing our 1-3-1. One, one. Are you likely to use the zone again somewhere? Or, I mean, did you like it well enough that did you consider using it down the road? Probably? I don't think it's our best defense by far. You know, we certainly haven't practiced it. Uh, nearly as much as our man-to-man. -man. You know, our man-to-man -man is, um, you know, ranks in the, in the low 20s in the country in terms of our uh, efficiency. So I, I think we've become a team that it, it really understands what we want to do on the defensive end. You know, we're playing some big-time challenges, not only individually, but, you know, how teams construct their offense. But, uh, you know, it, it's going to be at times a secondary defense. How much we use it uh, will really depend on the opponent in the situation. How do you... I guess as the coach differentiate from frustration that could lead to 
bad kind of frustration and hanging your heads versus frustration that can be motivation in, in a situation like the one your team is in right now? Um, I don't know. That's a, it's a tough question. I don't really understand that. I'm saying like, how do you let, how do you use this as maybe motivation, the frustration of the last few weeks versus letting it bother your players? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's natural for it to bother them. Um, you know, our, our, our players, like a lot of players, you know, are in this sport at this level because um, they hate losing. They want to win. Um, and we're getting to the best part of the year. And so, you know, let's, let's, let's be excited to play. I really liked our team's response over the last, you know, few practices because there's so much to play for when you get down the stretch of February and, and the early March. And as I said the other day, uh, there's about 330 Division One teams that would give their right arm to be uh, standing at the half-court circle, um, you know, prior to practice. Uh, we have a lot to play for, and I think our guys recognize that. I think we have to learn from those experiences, um, and so it would be interesting to see our response. Outside of the fact that it would mean that you've got a better record, What's the importance of the double by, you think, in the ACC tournament? I don't know. I mean, I, I think you could, you know, obviously the, the, the teams that get double buys are the, are the teams that have proven themselves through 18 conference games. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of stuff goes out the window. You know, there's also, I think, something to be said for a team that plays two nights in a row on, on on a neutral floor and get sort of used to the surroundings where, where another team um, maybe is playing for the very first time. So I may go either way. You could probably do uh, a lot of analyzing of all these conference tournaments. Um, team that's pe playing its best basketball at the end of the year um, believes in itself and can hit some shots, generally keeps advancing. Do you think you've done enough to be in the tournament right now? Um, I don't have to worry about that. You know, we've got more games to play. Um, you know, I think anybody out there that covers all these all these uh, teams would say yes, but uh, it's completely irrelevant when we have more games on our schedule left. How much attention do you pay to the bracket projections? I mean, you're, you're aware of it, but um, that doesn't mean you really weigh them that much. I mean, yeah, certainly you're aware of it. Any, anything that covers our team or follows college basketball, we're going to have an eye on it. Mm -hmm. But uh, you don't take much stock in it, um, you know, before your season's done. How do you? I realize you're a game-to-game -game guy. Um, how can you maybe work with a guy like Darius and guys who you know are going to be here beyond this year, and may have future responsibilities tick up even more in a season where you have a guy like Kristen who is going to take the majority of those minutes? How do you sort of cultivate that for? development purposes? Well, I think every experience that these guys have in practice uh, and in the games, you know, uh, make, makes them, you know, more and more experienced. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a pretty simple formula. The, the, the guys that produce uh, the best in practice and play the best in practice play in games. And I think a lot of times people think that the coaches determine playing time and even sometimes your players feel that way. But uh, ultimately, the players determine, you know, playing time. And um, if you took a player out of the equation, you know, if you took him out of the equation, you said, who on your team, you know, not you, uh, would you have in the starting lineup and who would you play, you know, it'd be really close to, if not identical to what the coaches do. But, you know, then you throw your own personal bias in there, it becomes a little bit more tough. Mm -hmm. So. What's your analysis of, of the shooting problems that Dwayne's going through right now? Um, got to take really good shots. You know, I thought the other day he took a, a really tough one in transition. <clears throat> His feet are set, and, um, you know, he, he's got a good look. We want him shooting it every single time. And confidence is a, uh, a wild thing. And, uh, you know, I think Dwayne, you know, he, he really uh, wants to win. And sometimes he feels like he's letting his team down. He can't worry about, you know, that. He just has to worry about taking good ones. And if he does, he's got everybody on that bench, um, you know, supportive of, of him taking shots.
Ryan mentioned that you know when they're going when an opponent's going through one of these runs that they need to learn how not to panic or, or try not to be the hero. As a coach, how do you kind of project that from the sideline to hey, calm down, guys? And yeah, I think it it starts in practice. You know, putting guys in those type of situations um, so that they handle, um, so that they have a feel for how to handle it. And um, you know, when it goes well in practice, explaining you know what we did uh, to make it work out. And the reverse is true. You know, if you're making bad decisions, if you're getting sped up, if you're not aware of a shot clock or a 10 second count, you know, those are also uh, lessons that we try to teach in practice so that it carries over into the game. Anything else for Coach? I just had one random question. So we talked about defensive kills a couple of times this year. You hear about all these different coaches, like Buzz has a whiteboard that he keeps, all these different coaches chart stuff. How extensive is your in-game chart that you mark for deflections or whatever it is? Um, I don't think it's, it's it's very extensive. I mean, we certainly um, uh, we keep track of, of what other teams are running and what they're calling. Um, you know, we, we keep track of our efficiency on the offensive end, what we're running, um, you know, what's worked well, what hasn't, obviously. Um, but, you know, as, as far as like uh, analytics and data, like real time, um, not, not a whole lot. You know, you're obviously looking at key things that are a big concern in the game you know rebounding turnovers you know all that stuff play a part but you know why are those things happening uh, I think a lot of times is, is really based on uh, you know what what the other team's running what you're running you know what's working what's not working Great. thanks coach thanks to you